Remembering those who've died in war is a practice familiar to us. When British military personnel die on active service, they're entitled to have their bodies returned, a funeral at public expense, and a service headstone maintained in perpetuity. Collective commemoration has become part of our national psyche ever since the end of World War I, when George V inaugurated the tradition. Ceremonies have subsequently been held every year on the 11th of November to memorialise those who've died in combat. And ceremonies are held not only in Britain, but across the Commonwealth and in many other countries of the world. They often take place at a cenotaph, a Greek word meaning empty tomb, which may resemble Edward Lutyen's monument at Whitehall, which was unveiled on November the 11th, 1920. And in some Commonwealth countries, an oration is part of the traditional ceremonial activities. For the Australians, Anzac Day on April the 25th, especially at the Canberra Cenotaph, is arguably more emotionally important. But it's on Remembrance Day that an annual speech is delivered by an esteemed Australian public figure. And the most renowned of these speeches is probably the one delivered by the former Labour Prime Minister, Paul Keating, in 1993. It's quoted frequently in Australia, studied intensively, and has shaped Australian national identity, psyche, and democratic culture. Yet for many centuries, from medieval times until the mid-19th century, service people killed in action could expect that their corpses would be subjected to neglect and indignity, often simply being left to rot. The turning point was the Treaty of Frankfurt, which marked the end of the Franco-Prussian War that was signed on the 10th of May, 1871. According to Article 16, the French and German governments agreed to allow the military dead of either nation to be taken back to their national soil for burial. The centuries of indignity preceding this treaty would have shocked most people in the Greek and Roman worlds. Roman legions tried to bury their dead with care and honour. In AD 15, Germanicus interrupted a dangerous campaign to inter such remains as he could find of the numerous legionaries killed by Germanic tribes in the Battle of Teutoburg in AD 9. Going back more than three centuries after the momentous Battle of Cairo near in 338 BCE, which effectively secured Philip of Macedon's supremacy in southern Greece, both sides buried their dead according to punctilious rules shaped by respect for religious traditions. The Thebans put up a famous monument with the statue of a lion to mark the mound in which their dead had been interred. More than 200 skeletons were found when the site was discovered in 1880. And the Athenians awarded a great honour to the 192 of their compatriots who were killed defending Greece and Athens at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BCE. They erected a memorial and a large tumulus so that the corpses could rest where they'd fallen and receive the honours due to heroes. But the most famous funeral ceremony of antiquity and perhaps of all time took place 59 years after that in 431 when Pericles delivered a funeral oration in the classical Athenian cemetery known as the Keramikos. And this oration has exerted an incalculable influence over public oratory ever since Thucydides' text, which preserves it, was first printed in entirety in 1502 and then followed by numerous translations into modern languages. So in this talk, I'm going to describe the occasion, the venue, and the text of the speech before returning in conclusion to the influence of Pericles' seminal oration on President Lincoln at Gettysburg. So, the occasion. All through the Peloponnesian War, the Athenians gathered annually at their city's burial ground to lay coffins in the earth for the dead of each civic tribe and listen to a speech in their praise. The custom may not have been inaugurated until the mid-460s, but it was felt, like Greek tragedy, to represent an important component of the civic discourse of Athens 
and to be inseparable from the democratic constitution. The important point was that it was administered by the state. All the men killed in action were buried together without distinction, according to rank. Rich families were prevented from using the occasion of a family funeral to show off their wealth to the poor or bereaved. The ceremonies were organised by the state magistrate in charge of the military, the polymarch. And the most famous of all the Athenian funeral speeches was the one delivered by the Athenian statesman Pericles during the winter of the first year of the Peloponnesian War. The speech was invested with quite as much significance as the interment. Thucydides' Pericles opens his by remarking that the institution of the formal funeral speech, the epitaphios logos, has always been praised by those who deliver the speech. I'm going to read a description of the occasion because it's so beautiful by a 19th century American politician called Edward Everett. It becomes from this description of Pericles' speech comes from the opening of Everett's speech of 19th November 1863 at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, during the dedication of the soldiers' national ceremony there. The Battle of Gettysburg of July 1863 had been one of the deadliest battles of the Civil War. 7,000 men died, over 10,000 were captured or missing. And Everett spoke immediately before Abraham Lincoln, who then delivered the far more famous Gettysburg oration, to which I'm going to return at the end of the lecture. Now, Everett was now an elderly man, an expert classicist, who'd been professor of Greek at Harvard before he entered politics. He'd served both as Secretary of State and as Senator before retiring and becoming one of Lincoln's most loyal supporters. And this is how his speech opens, adapting the description of the Athenian state funeral he found in Thucydides. Standing beneath this serene sky, overlooking these broad fields, now reposing from the labours of the waning year. The mighty Alleghenies dimly towering before us, the graves of our brethren beneath our feet. It's with hesitation that I raise my poor voice to break the eloquent silence of God and nature. But the duty to which you've called me must be performed. Grant me, I pray, your indulgence and your sympathy. It was appointed by law in Athens that the obsequies of the citizens who fell in battle should be performed at the public expense and in the most honourable manner. Their bones were carefully gathered up from the funeral pyre where their bodies were consumed and brought home to the city. For three days before the interment, they lay in state beneath tents of honour to receive the votering offerings, votive offerings of friends and relatives, flowers, weapons, precious ornaments, painted vases, Wonders of art which, after 2,000 years, adorn the museums of modern Europe, the last tributes of surviving affection. Ten coffins of funeral cypress received the honourable deposit, one for each of the city tribes, and an eleventh in honour of the unrecognised, but not therefore unhonoured dead, and of those whose remains could not be recovered. On the fourth day, the mournful procession was formed. Mothers, wives, sisters, daughters led the way. And to them it was permitted by the simplicity of ancient manners to utter aloud lamentations for the beloved. The male relatives and friends of the deceased followed. Citizens and foreigners closed the train. Thus marshaled, they moved to the place of internment in that famous Keramikas, the most beautiful suburb of Athens, which had been adorned by Cimon, the son of Miltiades, with walks and fountains and columns, whose groves were filled with altars and shrines and temples, whose gardens were kept for evergreen by the streams from the neighbouring hills and shaded with trees sacred to Minerva, coeval with the foundation of the city. The pathways gleamed with the monuments of the illustrious dead, the work of the most consummate masters that ever gave life to marble. And there... Beneath overarching plane trees, on a lofty stage erected for the purpose, it was ordained that a funeral oration should be pronounced by citizens of Athens in the presence of the assembled multitude. That is how Everett set up the scene for the commencement of Lincoln's address. So, the location. 
The Keramikos was an area of Athens to the northwest of the city centre, um, not far from the site where Plato's Academy would soon be founded as an ancient sanctuary. The word was used originally for an area just outside and inside the city walls, but by Pericles' time, it usually signified the public graveyard or demosion sema, that is, the cemetery. It took its name, Keramikos, from the potters or kerames who lived and worked there, owing to the excellent clay available by that part of the river Eridanos. It was said to be the loveliest suburb in Athens, and it had a very lively nightlife. It was the place of religious significance for another reason. It was there that the sacred way to Eleusis began, the road along which the procession moved annually to the Eleusinian Mysteries. Now, this area became first used as um, a cemetery in um, about 12,000, uh, 1200. 1200 BCE, but it was just after the Persian Wars of 490 to 479, it took on something like the appearance of what we can still visit today. When the new city wall was built in 478, funeral sculptures were integrated into the city wall and two large gates were built. One was the sacred gate, the other was the deep ilon or double-gated one, near which important citizens, including Cleisthenes and Pericles, were interred. And this is where the processions or Pompeii for Athena during her festivals would begin, and great sacrificial feasts of roast meat, beef, were prepared. And in fact, dozens of cattle bones have been discovered there. Now, the Keramikos as a whole was discovered in April 1863, the very same year as Gettysburg, when a Greek worker dug up a carved gravestone or stele. And I think this attracted the attention of the Americans, Edward Everett and Abraham Lincoln. Since then, of course, both Greek and German archaeologists have worked intensively, and it's a spectacular place to visit. The museum is packed with fascinating finds. Don't miss it if you go to Athens. Now, the speaker, Pericles, had been born in 495, was now the most respected statesman in Athens in his mid-60s. He had a reputation as an incomparable orator. He spoke quite fast, but with great clarity and in a resonant, beautiful voice that contemporaries said left all the other speakers at the starting line. His democratic credentials were impeccable. He was from the same family as Cleisthenes, who'd founded the Athenian democracy, and he was the son of a Persian war hero. From 461, for 30 years, he dominated Athenian political and public life and was re-elected as one of the 10 generals repeatedly. He had always uh, promoted policies by which the Athenians could benefit financially and strategically from their allies, who were increasingly seen as imperial subject states to be taxed. He'd initiated and often led successful campaigns in northern Greece, so the Athenians could colonise Thrace. He put down rebellions against Athens in Samos and Byzantium. He expanded Athenian activities in the Black Sea. But his most enduring achievement is his plan, initiated in 447, to use some of the wealth the Athenians had acquired from their empire to finance the architectural transformation of the Acropolis, where the city's gods, as well as its treasure house, were um, resident. The Persians had raised the temples of the Acropolis into the ground during the 480 invasion, and until Pericles, they had not been rebuilt, been left like ground zero. In 432, the year before the funeral oration, the magnificent new Parthenon, Temple of Athena, with its Doric columns, friezes, and pediment sculptures, had been finally completed. The frieze, which runs round the whole of, well, which ran until Lord Elgin, round the whole of the outside of the outside surface of the inner building of the temple, represents a series of scenes suggestive of a great procession 
in honour of the goddess housed inside. Horses and riders, chariots, men bearing musical instruments, water, jars, trays, sacrificial animals, a group of important men, perhaps heroes, and gods and rituals. By the time the Parthenon was completed, visitors also had to pass through the Propylia, the innovative complex of edifices surrounding the western entrance to the Acropolis, itself accessible only by a long series of wide stone stairs to get you into the sacred mood. So how did the Peloponnesian War begin? In 432, the Spartans were persuaded to summon a meeting of the Peloponnesian League in order to hear all the other states' grievances against Athens. As a result, the Spartans voted in support of the motions that the Athenians had broken the terms of the fragile peace between them, thus, in effect, declaring war. The Spartan king Archidamus II began invading Attica and occupying farmland. And although the Spartans only stayed a few weeks at a time, the threat they posed was sufficient to persuade many of the rural Athenians to follow the policy advocated by Pericles, move themselves, their families, and even their furniture from ancestral farmsteads in the countryside to within the Long Walls. These people would have been at this oration. The um, walls stretched from the city to the harbours at Piraeus, but being torn from their ancient roots caused severe emotional problems. Many had to make temporary homes in the turrets of the walls, and these were some of the people Pericles was addressing. By midsummer, the Spartans were ravaging land at Akarnae, only a few miles from Athens itself. The young man became very impatient at Pericles' policy of keeping the Athenians safe within the walls. And in the late summer, after the Spartans returned home for the winter, Pericles finally led a big force out into Megarian territory. And Athenian self-confidence had never been so high. Thucydides reports... This was, without doubt, the largest army of Athenians ever assembled, the state being still in the flower of her strength and as yet unvisited by plague. Full 10,000 heavy infantry were in the field, all Athenian citizens, besides 3,000 in another place before Potidaea. And then the resident aliens who joined in the incursion were at least 3,000 strong, besides which was a multitude of light troops quite a lot of these people had just died. Thucydides is also the reason why we know what Pericles said to the Athenians at that funeral. Thucydides wrote the second great work of historiography in ancient Greek after Herodotus, his history of the Peloponnesian War. He was involved in the war as a general several years after the funeration himself, and he must have written much of his book in the home he retired to in Thrace after he was exiled later in 423. He may have died in the year 411, the year his narrative breaks off. He's highly analytical. He explains everything from human nature and human decision-making. He's not interested in divine intervention. But his greatest legacy is the tragic tenor of his work. He's frank about the atrocities which humans on both sides in the war committed and about real politique. He candidly assumes that Greek city-states were always motivated by expediency and their own self-interest. He knows that big, rich and powerful states want to stay big, rich and powerful. He makes no attempts to glamorise even the communities with whom his partisan sympathies lie, Athens. And this is why Nietzsche so admired him and said, from the despicable beautification and idealization of the Greeks, which the classically educated youth carries away into real life as reward for high school training, there is no cure so fundamental as Thucydides. Thucydides is the great culmination and last manifestation of the strong, severe, hard realism instinctive in the more ancient Greeks. Now, does the speech, as reported in Thucydides, bear a close relation to what Pericles actually said? Earlier in the history, Thucydides admits that his practice in recording speeches has been to say what he thought the occasion demanded. But in this particular case, I think he may have had access to an actual transcript. 
He stresses the significance of the occasion, the unusual size of the audience. The rostrum was made specially to make the speech audible by as many people as possible. And there were resident foreigners who'd lost sons, as well as citizen families present, not to mention women. And this was a very rare opportunity for an Athenian politician to address citizen women directly. Very rare. Thucydides is likely, more than likely, to have been present on the occasion as an ambitious young statesman and military man who was a dedicated admirer of Pericles. It was also winter when no military campaigns were in process. And Thucydides also introduces the speech saying that Pericles said this. Not, as he often does, Pericles said something like this or something to this effect. So let's actually go on to the actual text. The speech itself falls into six parts, of which the third, the eulogy of Athens itself, is by far the longest and most important. First, Pericles discusses the tradition of the annual speech itself. Second, in a programmatic section, he explains the plan of the speech, in which he won't dwell on the glories of past battles and Athenian victories, as most speakers at public funerals have done, but he's going to focus on the principles of action, institutions, and lifestyle which have made the city worth fighting for. And then third, in the big, long kernel of the speech, he offers a rousing account of the merits and beauties of the Athenian democratic constitution and culture. The point is to communicate why Athens is not only worth fighting for, but dying for. Fourthly, he discusses the principal views and courage of the fallen. Fifth, he turns to address his listeners directly, first parents, then sons and brothers, and briefly widows. Rather than comfort them, he says they should emulate the example of the dead. And sixth, a very short summation and formal dismissal. Now, of course, the speech has been analysed repeatedly by scholars, historians, political scientists, rhetoricians, and indeed practising politicians. It would be a fine exercise to read it out in entirety, and actually, I considered doing that instead of lecturing. But unfortunately, time does not allow this indulgence. So in this part of the lecture, I'm going unashamedly to select passages which strike me as particularly interesting, either because they tell us something important about Pericles and Athens, or because they remain, in my ears at least, inspirational. So Pericles opens with a proem, saying how difficult a challenge it is to find the right words on, the, on an occasion of such gravity. He discusses the likely emotional responses of the audience and implicitly gives advice on the correct frame of mind in which to receive his words. He says that the loved ones of the departed will probably think he's not effusive enough, while others may feel envious of the praise he's bestowing on the dead or feel inadequate in comparison. He attempts to establish a bond of trust between him and the whole audience, he says, he must find a middle path that alienates neither group and implicitly asks for their understanding as he does so. Since our ancestors, he says, have set the seal of their approval on the practice of the funeral oration, I must obey and to the utmost of my power shall endeavour to satisfy the wishes and beliefs of all who hear me. In the second programmatic section, he explains why he, doesn't plan, why he does not plan to praise earlier generations who fought and died for Athens. That would be like giving a speech at the Cenotaph that didn't discuss the Crimean War, World War I, and World War II. He's not going to do it. This was a very unusual departure. And we do have some other ancient funeral orations and information about yet others. It was indeed customary to rehearse the glories of the fall of the Athenian tyrants in the late 6th century, of the Persian Wars, the victories at Marathon, Salamis, and Plataea. Other funeral orators talked about wars against rival Greek states, or even mythical wars in far more remote history, such as the legendary victory of the Athenians over the Amazonian warrior women who invaded Attica 
and attempted to set up a government on the Areopagus. But Pericles says no. He says, I'm much more interested in the people of today who are continuing this great work. And he defines precisely what he'll discuss instead of the past. I want to point out by what principles of action we rose to power, under what institutions and through what manner of life our empire became great. So principles of actions, institutions, manner of life. I conceive that such thoughts are not unsuited to the occasion. This numerous assembly of citizens and strangers may profitably, profitably listen to them. Now, the kernel is section three, which is also much the longest. It is an account of the merits and beauties of the democratic constitution, which he says is an example to all other city-states. Athens is called a democracy, he says, because the administration is in the hands of the many, not of the few. I think some of the Labour propagandists <laughs> have got hold of that one. Justice is available to all in private litigation, he says, the criterion for advancement in public life is merit. Poverty is no bar to public service, which wasn't altogether true. And public recognition. In private life, there's tolerance, he says, and an assumption that each man is free to do as he likes and people aren't judged for living their lives in different ways from their peers. And I think that was true. But when it comes to public life, he says, there is real reverence, unanimity and humility. Respect for the state authorities and the laws constrains the behaviour of all, especially those who've been um, uh, damaged or injured, uh, sorry, especially protecting those who've been damaged or injured. Every Athenian is guided by respect for what all the Greeks called the unwritten laws, the fundamental taboos and imperatives that protected family members from abuse by each other, the recipients of oaths, supplements, and the rights of the dead. It's the unwritten laws that Antigone says... She's following in Sophocles' Antigone. Pericles then celebrates the lifestyle of Athens. He says, there are plentiful recreations, games, and sacrifices. Athenian homes are elegant. The delightfulness of everyday life in their lovely city, and he's, of course, thinking now of the Acropolis buildings he's just finished, helps to banish sorrow. The city prides itself, moreover, on its openness. He says, our foreigners are never expelled from here. Life is conducted in a transparent way without fear of foreigners gaining access to secrets. And here Pericles' pride really is justifiable. Even the staunchest critics of Athens were impressed by its cosmopolitan atmosphere. One anti-democratic pamphleteer by custom called the old oligarch observed it was the fact of Athenian naval power that made so many types of luxury available in Athens, whether from Sicily, Cyprus, Egypt, Lydia, or the Black Sea. The Athenian instinct, says the oligarch, to mingle with various peoples has made their speech a potpourri of different elements. Hearing every kind of dialect, they've taken something from each. Most Greeks use their own dialect where in life and type of dress, but the Athenians use a mixture from all the Greeks and all the barbarians. Cosmopolitan ideal. Pericles continues by discussing the Athenian system of education and military training. They are efficient. And yet the Athenians live a far more relaxed life than Greeks in military states such as Sparta. One of the great advantages of our training, he says, is that there's little emphasis on thinking about death, but an understanding of how to enjoy peacetime, recreation. And this section of the speech, I suspect, is the one that lies behind the question, sadly apocryphally attributed to Winston Churchill, when asked if it was proposed to cut funding arts to support, funding arts to support the war effort. He's said to have said, but I think he probably didn't, then what would we be, be fighting for? <coughs> and their beautiful education, which consists um, as much of the arts and drama as, uh, and intellectual development as military drill, makes Athenians, says Pericles, unusually brave. The mind expansion makes them braver than just military training. 
And here he relates the Athenians' advanced aesthetic sensibility and love of the arts and intellectual matters to their ability to defend their empire. We are lovers of the beautiful in our tastes. Our strength lies in our opinion, not in deliberation and discussion, but that knowledge which is gained by discussion preparatory to action. We have a peculiar power of thinking before we act and of acting too, whereas other men are courageous from ignorance but hesitate upon reflection. And they are surely to be esteemed the bravest spirits who, having the clearest sense both of the pain and pleasure of life, do not, on that account, shrink from danger. The best educated citizen is going to be the bravest. Athenians, he says, are good at friendship, prefer to bestow gifts than receive them. I say, averse Pericles, that Athens is the school of Hellas, and that the individual Athenian in his own person has the power of adapting himself to the most varied forms of action with the utmost versatility and grace. Now, here he's defining the Athenian cultural personality to which he wants everyone in that audience to aspire. And he says there are, per there are permanent witnesses of the truth of his claims. He must be thinking of his own building programme when he proudly announces, there are mighty monuments of our power which will make us the wonder of this and of succeeding ages. We shall not need the praise of Homer or any other panegyrist whose poetry may please just for the moment, even though his representation of the facts will not bear the light of day. And he concludes the praise of Athens with this rousing statement. Such is the city for whose sake these men nobly fought and died, they couldn't bear the thought she might be taken from them. Every one of us who should survive should gladly toil on her behalf for their country. And this claim is widely thought to have inspired John F. Kennedy's admonition in his inaugural speech when he said, and he had a classicist speechwriter, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. The fourth section turns to the sacrifice made by the dead themselves. Pericles says, I have dwelt upon the greatness of Athens. I want to show you that we're contending for a higher prize than those who enjoy none of our privileges and to establish by manifest proof the merits of these men whom I'm now commemorating. Their loftiest praise has already been spoken for in magnifying their city I have magnified them, and men like them, whose virtues made her glorious. Then he embarks on a more conventional theme, that death can be advantageous if looked at from both the civic and the personal perspectives. A glorious death fighting for such a homeland puts the final seal for all time on the estimation of a man's worth. Even if he's erred before, says Pericles, by such courage in the face of death, men wipe the slate clean. It's all right to have been a bad boy, provided you die on the battlefield. They blotted out the evil with the good. They benefited the state more by their public service than they ever injured her by private action. Both rich and poor, he says, amongst the dead, equally won honour because they deemed the punishment of their enemies was sweeter than any of these things, and they could fall in no nobler cause. They determined at the hazard of their lives to be honourably avenged and to leave the rest. They resigned to hope, the unknown chance of happiness. In the face of death, they resolved to rely upon themselves alone. And when the moment came, they resisted and suffered. They did not fly and save their lives. They ran away from the world of dishonour. But on the battlefield, their feet stood fast, in one instant, at the height of their fortune, they passed away from the scene, not of their fear, but of their glory. It creates a wonderful picture for the bereaved of the moment of the death of their loved ones. And with this idea of the dead leaving the scene of their glory, Pericles at last returns to address those left behind. He says they'll all derive their greatest comfort 
not from focusing so much on the bravery of their lost loved ones, but from this. Fix your eyes on the greatness of Athens until you become filled with love for her. And when you are impressed by the spectacle of her glory, reflect that this empire has been acquired by men who knew their duty, had the courage to do it, who in the hour of conflict had the fear of dishonour present to them, and who, if ever they failed in an enterprise, would not allow their virtues to be lost to their country, freely gave their lives to her as the fairest offering they could present at her feast. This is a diplomatic way of acknowledging that some of the men had died in the process of losing battles, not winning them. And at this point, he rather suddenly shifts from this doggedly concrete real-world environment in which his speech has so far operated. He's not mentioned the gods. Extraordinary. He's eschewed any metaphysical flights of fancy about afterlives in Elysium or pleasing the local civic gods, even Athena. But now he embarks on a rousing metaphor to evoke the abstract idea of perennial fame. These men, he says, have received a form of immortality in praise which grows not old and the noblest of all tombs. I speak not of that in which their remains are laid, but of that in which their glory survives and is proclaimed always and on every fitting occasion, both in word and deed. The whole earth is the tomb of famous men. Not only are they commemorated by columns and inscriptions then in their own country, but in foreign lands too there dwells an unwritten memorial of them, graven not on stone, but on the hearts of men. Rather than await the vicissitudes of fate in life off the battlefield, it's better to be struck by death, death that comes unperceived at a time when a man is full of courage and animated by the general hope. So with that address to all of the bereaved, he then divides them into three groups to deliver individual pieces of advice. First, he acknowledges the pain of the parents of the dead, especially when they see parents, other parents, whose sons are still alive. But there is an answer, he says, at least for those still young enough to have more children. This reads rather brutally to our 21st century ears and sensibilities. Not only will the children who may hereafter be born make them forget their own lost ones, but the city will be doubly a gainer. She won't be left desolate, she'll be safer. But even those who pass their prime can find comfort, says Pericles, sounding to our ears more brutal still. Congratulate yourselves, you've been happy during the greater part of your days. Remember that your life of sorrow won't last long. <laughs> Promise not to laugh and be comforted by the glory of those who are gone. For the love of honour alone is ever young, not riches, as some say. Honour is the delight of men when they're old and useless. To the sons and brothers of the dead, he acknowledges that emulating the dead will be arduous. But the good thing about being dead, if the death was glorious, is a freedom from criticism and detraction of rivals. To the widows, he's notoriously blunt and unsympathetic. And if I am to speak of womanly virtues to those who will henceforth be widows, let me sum them up in one short admonition. To a woman not to show more weakness than is natural to her sex is a great glory. To be mentioned as little as possible among men, too, either in praise or blame. So don't be worse than you actually are as a woman, and shut up. Now, just what is going on here? Why did Pericles feel the need to say this? How much did the bereaved women of Athens complain about their plight, as they did 20 years later in Aristophanes' Lysistrata? Is he simply reminding the quiet and docile female population to remain quiet and docile? Is he being descriptive? Or is he actually forced to mention the women because he's faced with a militant, distraught, and noisy group of angry ritual mourners, grandmothers, wives, sisters, daughters, who are going to make life extremely difficult 
for politicians advocating war. We just don't know. That would be prescriptive. But it is clear that the state funeral had entailed the transfer of the leading role in obsequies from families, and particularly women, to the state and its leading male representatives. These are private funerals. The relatives of the fallen were, by this public ceremony and the days preceding it, kept at a physical distance from the bodies. They were deprived of the physically intimate mourning rites beside the corpse, which women had engaged in for many centuries, personally washing and anointing the loved one's body privately, tearing and cutting off hair, ripping clothes, beating breasts, gouging cheeks with fingernails until the blood ran, hammering the earth with fists, and giving voice to very frightening semi-sung ritual dirges with which we're familiar from the Iliad and tragedy. In reality, legislation had been passed in the 6th century which curtailed excessive practices of self-mutilation and other displays of grief by women. And that was probably to prevent aristocratic families competing with each other in expenditure on funerals. You could actually rent a gang of female mourners to make the noise louder at your funeral if you've got enough money. But in 431, even the display of the body no longer took place at the door of the private household. Uh, they were conducted in a public civic space, probably the marketplace. The widows may have been reassured that Pericles' brief summation does at least then affirm that any children whose fathers have died on active service will be raised henceforward at public expense, which they were. It was one of the best customs of ancient Athens. Yet for all its resident praise of democracy and patriotism, the addresses to the bereaved at the end of Pericles' funeral oration forcibly remind us that classical Athens was a militaristic state and a brutal imperial patriarchy. When Pericles mounted that specially constructed platform, he delivered the most influential speech ever delivered in Western history. Its praise of democratic values for which that year's crop of war dead had laid down their lives has informed countless significant orations since, including Abraham's, Abraham Lincoln's address at Gettysburg. And when Lincoln planned his Gettysburg oration, in preparation for which he certainly read Everett's preceding speech, he followed Pericles' example. He praised not the dead in themselves, but the principles that the new United States, in whom, whose name they had died, and he manages to sort of just about get the dead of both sides in there, the principles in his name, um, in, in, along, um, according to which it should be founded. And in a brilliant prize-winning book, historian Gary Wills argued that Lincoln's speech constituted a revolution in thought because Lincoln assumed the primacy of the Declaration of Independence by Jefferson over the Constitution as the supreme articulation of American government. He proposed at Gettysburg that the United States is a single nation fundamentally and a single people rather than an association of separate states. The moments at which Everett and Lincoln spoke were of very similar historical significance, even if in the USA it was on a large, far larger scale in terms of human numbers to the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. The residents of the small Pennsylvania town had unexpectedly to cope with thousands of rotting corpses. And Lincoln follows Pericles, if not in precise verbal echoes or quotations, but in grasping an historic opportunity to frame a vision of his whole community and its values and to inspire the audience to create a future together according to that vision. Lincoln also followed the classical structure of Pericles' oration in discussing first the dead and secondly the living, the survivors, the bereaved, and instructing them on their future. 
And Lincoln's speech has in turn inspired most subsequent American presidents, including Barack Obama and, as we've suggested, JFK. In conclusion, sadly, for the Athenians' sense of pride in themselves and their city and their empire, which, according to Thucydides, found by far its most eloquent articulation in Pericles' speech, the Athenians were about to face one of their greatest challenges in history. By the next spring, when the Spartans began to invade Attica again, the Athenians began to die from a fearsome plague which they caught from the water supplies. And the plague was much exacerbated by the close quarters in which they were confined within the city walls, having come in from the countryside. Neither doctors nor prayers to the gods helped. Pericles and his sons died from it. Fortunately for posterity and us, Thucydides, who preserved that funeral speech for us, despite himself contracting the plague and describing it in agonising detail, he actually recovered. He survived to tell us about Pericles' last great contribution to Athenian morale and history. But many others who heard Pericles' speech did not survive. A mass grave of the right date for the plague was recovered in 1994 to 5 during the excavations preparing for the construction of the subway station at Keramikos. The, archaeologi the archaeologist Effie Baziotopoulou Valavani found 90 skeletons, 10 belonging to children, very hastily and roughly interred, just as Thucydides said they were. Many of these people will have been present just a year or two previously at Pericles' funeral speech. Thank you very much.